you know, whatever, whatever posture uh, you want to get in that allows you to, to listen in that way, that'd be great. These guys are going to get in place as I do that. And I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 14 uh, through much of 15. So again, settle in and, and just listen. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. And going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, this hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And once more he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he found them sleeping again because their eyes were heavy. And they didn't know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, he kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, Jesus said, that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you in the temple courts. You didn't arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest. All the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law came together. But Peter followed at a distance right into the courtyard. And he sat there with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they didn't find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements didn't agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony. Well, we heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands in three days and will build another not made with hands. But even that testimony didn't agree. And then the high priest stood up before them and said, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. He gave no answer. And again the high priest asked him, Are you Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need more witnesses? You've heard this blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him and struck him with their fists, and they said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him closely. She said, you also were with that Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. And again he denied it. And after a little while, those standing near Peter said, Surely you're one of them. You sound like a Galilean. 
And he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows twice, you'll disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now, very early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders, the teachers of the law, the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. They bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. And the chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus made no reply. Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom of the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. And the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium. He called together the whole company of soldiers, and they put a purple robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head, and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! And again and again they struck him on the head with a staff, and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. So as you've just heard, these final events that lead up to Jesus being hung on the cross. Final acts, final hours final words as Jesus anticipates his death he speaks words with great intent each word each phrase is a window through which the cross can be better understood Jesus makes seven statements while he hangs on the cross and they include a final prayer of forgiveness a plea honored a request of love a question of suffering a confession of humanity and a call of deliverance, and lastly, a cry of completion. Each of those sayings will be presented by a different member of our leadership team tonight. Tonight, you'll hear seven voices reflect on seven sayings spoken by Christ on the cross. The event that's not only changed the lives of the speakers in front of you, but has changed the whole world. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. Luke 23, 32 through 34. The first saying of Jesus on the cross is traditionally called the word of forgiveness. Jesus says this as he's looking down from the cross after he's just been crucified between two criminals. One of his followers, one of the twelve, had betrayed him. Jesus had been mocked, ridiculed, and humiliated. He had been arrested 
stood trial and wrongfully found guilty. His own people demanded him crucified. They cho chose to release a murderer instead of him. He had been beaten and scourged. Most of his disciples, his friends, have run. They deserted him. Peter, one of his closest friends, denied him three times that he even knew him. Jesus, in his great physical pain, the skin and muscle on his back have been shredded, his head cut from the crown of thorns, nails have been hammered through his wrists and feet. And he is having to press on the nail through his feet to lift up his body to be able to breathe. His body failing. And his response, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I think in this moment he was thinking about more than just those around him at the time. Thinking about the crowd <laughs> that only briefly before had been praising him as he entered the city. And maybe thinking about us too. How many times have we betrayed him or denied him? Ignored him when he's trying to speak directly to us? I think Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Why he was sacrificing himself. Sin is what put him in this place. And he died for the sins of the world and for our sins too. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. As hard as it is sometimes to believe, there is nothing we could do, ever do, or nothing we've already done that he can't forgive. No. There's nothing we can do that would cause him to give up on us or write us off as a lost cause. He loves us unconditionally, and he's always going to forgive us. We are forgiven. Thanks, Jesus. But when I think about forgiveness, I just think forgiveness sucks. Real, complete forgiveness seems almost impossible. The surface-level forgiveness seems easy enough, though. I generally don't have any trouble forgiving people I don't really know, don't have to go home with. But that's, <laughs> but that's even true only when it comes to my version of forgiveness. My version of forgiveness generally comes with a laundry list of everything that was done wrong to me, several apologies and promises that that won't happen again. Rarely do I ever forgive as Jesus forgave. It's hard for me to even think about forgiving until justice has been served. Yet here, the ultimate injustice, that Jesus extends unasked for, unearned, and undeserved forgiveness. Truly, I think of Jesus bringing justice into this moment. This is how he serves justice. By bearing our sin, he not only redeemed us, but he gave us the ability to forgive. Without Christ working in my heart, I am completely unable to forgive. But even when I'm stewing in my bitterness, he loves me there. And he loves me more than just to leave me there. So what would Jesus tell me to do in my situations of unforgiveness? I think he would tell me to love as he loves, to forgive as he forgives. It is not easy, and it's not going to happen all at once. It takes an everyday decision of dependence on him to provide the how of forgiving. I'll end with this. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. One of the criminals who hung their hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? 
Save yourself and us. But the other criminals rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For are we getting what we deserved? But the man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The life of Jesus was a mission of love, and his death was no exception. The crucifixion of Jesus upon the cross is a lesson in living. Jesus loved to teach by using metaphor. The life and death of Jesus was a metaphor for the way we should uh, conduct our lives. According to Luke in chapter 23, it seems sure, at least at the beginning, one of his co-accused was riling against him. Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly for what we are getting, what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus was suffering in a way that we cannot begin to grasp or even particularly understand. So too was this criminal. He was never to come down from the cross alive, and yet he saw or sensed something, something in Jesus that moved him in such a way that it became the road to his salvation. If ever there was a soul hovering on the brink of hell, it was this criminal, a virtual nobody hanging beside him, the son of God in a heartbeat. He voiced what his intuition had detected, that Jesus was indeed the son of God. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What Jesus did was a wonderful example and understanding of acceptance of love, the life of Jesus, strength through adversity. Without hesitation, Jesus responded, responded to his plea of mercy. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. We can learn from one of the two who were crucified next to Jesus. It was never too late to repent or to ask the Lord to accept us. Jesus cleansed this man from his sins, received him graciously and justly, justified him unconditionally. He conferred upon the sinner the gift of eternal life, strength through adversity. Adversity and strength. In the last several months, there's been several challenges in our family, and I'm sure is yours as well. We've had some diagnosis of cancer. We struggled to find the right doctors, the weight of carrying the load to be strong when you're littered with fear, restlessness, and doubt. Or maybe when you have a wayward child that behaves differently than you expected. I'm not sure w why any child would do that, but for some reason they are. Or perhaps maybe a family member that just doesn't get it. Who knows? They just don't get it. I don't know why they don't get it. They should know. But at the point, it's easy uh, to be the thief that condemns and mocks Jesus. It comes quite naturally, actually, for me. When you're hurting and the only listening you're not to what's going on in your head, you're not listening to, to Jesus, you're just beating yourself up inside and out. It's, it's easy. It's easy to be that thief. It's not easy to be the, be the one in between two thieves. But when you're hurting, uh, that's where you end up a lot of the times and, until you snap back into it and someone reminds you. But when I'm reminded by a friend, I thought of something. You see, forgiveness is not only available for the thief, but available to all of us that believe, lean on, and seek his plan for our lives. Then we can experience paradise. 
Today, you will be with me in paradise. John's gospel reports in chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, that Jesus saw his own mother and the disciple standing near whom he loved. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, he took his mother into his family. Jesus' third saying on the cross is referred to as the word of relationship. And when it comes to relationships, that connection between mother and child has long been that central picture of what unconditional love and sacrifice has meant. One of the things I've seen while working in the prison over the last several years is that if a man has one family member that still writes him, one family member that still puts money on his books, one family member that calls him, and one family member that drives four hours one way every other weekend just to visit him for a couple hours and buy him a candy bar. Nine, nine times out of ten, that one family member is the man's mother. Everybody else turns away. They can't bear the shame or the pain or the need. Often it is only the mother who can look at her son without turning away. And one of the most significant things about mothers is that willingness to suffer for their children. And it starts at the beginning. The, the pain of childbirth does not end, though, when the child exits the womb. It lasts a lifetime. That suffering comes in waves often. And while the son or the daughter also brings their mother great joy, it seems that mothers bear a disproportionate amount of the emotional burden over the lifespan as compared with fathers and other family members. In the second chapter of Luke, Simeon prophesied over the young Jesus and over his proud parents, Mary and Joseph. And after saying a series of wonderful things about how Jesus was going to bring salvation and how he was going to be a light to the Gentile, he turns not to Joseph, but to Mary and says to her, a sword will pierce your soul too. And every parent knows what that means. To some extent, everybody knows what that means. And you've been through it. But certainly, maybe only the parent that has watched their son or daughter die and watched their life and breath ebb away and depart never to return, maybe that man or woman is the only one who really knows. And some of you here have had your soul pierced. Some of you know what this means. And yet somehow Mary stands at the foot of the cross. She stands. She has not collapsed in a heap. She is not held upright by some other family member. As far as we know, she doesn't run. She doesn't turn away. She stands. She watches. She bears witness. Soul pierced with the sword. And Jesus, in the midst of his own agony, honors his relationship with his mother in that moment of shared suffering. He wants only that she could be taken care of. And just as the beginning of their mother-son relationship was marked by that natural pain of childbirth, so too their shared pain on the cross gives birth to a new mother-son relationship. One of the strangest things about this arrangement is that Jesus had siblings. You know, Mary had other children, and yet Mary forms this new family with this new adopted son. This shared moment of pain bonds them together. And she opens herself up to something new, even as she loses this one that she loves. Uh, scientists, psychologists have known for some time that there's this chemical, it's this hormone called oxytocin, and it bonds people together. And it's released powerfully when a woman is nursing her child. It's one of the things that helps create that connection and that bonding in early infancy. And it makes sense that there would be something that would have to facilitate that kind of a connection. What isn't so obvious, maybe, is that what they've also discovered is that this same chemical, this same hormone, is also released powerfully during times of great stress when the body is under pain, 
when the mind is assailed by terrors and horrors. So we find that we humans are fearfully and wonderfully made in this way. We are specifically designed to bond with others in times of great pain. Struggle can be the birthplace of friendship, as those in the military well know. And some of you have seen people who have been estranged for years come back together in a few minutes through a stream of tears and a plate of meatloaf and green bean casserole at a family funeral. Then a moment that can turn around, that that grief and that suffering, and there's something that breaks through, and those bonds are restored. Pain can become this gateway to new relationships and to new beginnings if we are but willing to stand and face that pain and to let somebody else stand with us. And what Jesus said, and what I believe to be true with all my heart is this, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so to those of you who are mourning tonight, look around you. Behold your sons. Behold your mothers, your fathers, daughters, brothers, sisters. Our shared blood is the blood of Christ, and there is no stronger bond. The fourth saying of Jesus is found in Mark 15, 34. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I read this verse and try to put myself in Jesus' shoes, I can only imagine the confusion and disappointment that he must have felt. After all he had been through, temptations, unfair trials, and betrayal, his unwavering devotion to God had landed him on the cross next to two criminals in excruciating pain and humiliation. He's crying out to God, and God is seemingly not present. If I were Jesus, I would really struggle to find the logic in this situation. I can't compare my human experience with the price Jesus paid for us, but I can relate to the feeling of forsakenness. There's a confusion that results when you hear God, you follow him with your whole heart, and you end up in a place that doesn't look like you thought it would, and he feels distant. And I can certainly identify with the feelings of loneliness, pain, rejection, and despair. I think we all have probably felt this way at some point or another. But before we go any further, we should all understand that feeling forsaken is not necessarily a bad thing. We know that Jesus was both God and man and was incapable of sinning. Therefore, we know that feeling forsaken is not inherently evil. After all, Jesus felt this way. So if you're here today and you feel shameful of your feelings, reject that shame. Jesus Christ, our perfect Savior, felt forsaken. The phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is actually found in the Old Testament at the beginning of Psalm 22. And it reads like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. I won't read the rest of it, but the remainder of the psalm goes back and forth between despairing lamentation and acknowledgement of God's unending love and faithfulness. The juxtaposition mirrors my current mindset. Sometimes I wonder if it's even possible to have these thoughts of despair and still fundamentally know that God has not left me. And I wonder if one negates the other or lessens my faith. So the question is, how can we feel that God has forsaken us, but also fundamentally know that he is not and that we can trust him? Both of these ideas can exist in the same space if we understand that forsakenness is a feeling but God's unending faithfulness is a truth. It's great when our feelings are aligned with truths, but oftentimes this is not the case. Our feelings can be temporary and situational. When asked how she and her family survived in the concentration camps, Holocaust survivor Corey Ten Boom responded this way, not feeling, but believing. Feelings come and feelings go. They are deceitful. And all of that hell around us, the promises of the Bible kept us safe. 
Now, that's not to say that God will always give us exactly what we want or expect. It's unrealistic to limit God's omnipotence to the confines of our human experience. As our wise pastor Raymond says, God may not always rescue, but he always redeems. I don't think any of us are in an actual concentration camp, but it can feel like it at times. Regardless of the way you feel today or how dismal your situation looks, I encourage you to cling to the perfect promise, a Messiah to God's people manifested in the form of Jesus Christ, whose birth, life, death, and resurrection we celebrate this season. I pray that each and every one of you feels God's love and truly knows of his unending faithfulness. In John 19, 28, Jesus said, I thirst. This fifth word of Jesus, traditionally called the word of distress, is his only human expression of his physical suffering. No doubt Jesus experienced extreme thirst. He would have lost substantial quantity of bodily fluids, both sweat and blood, throughout the torturous events of that day. But notice, it is the only word word he spoke that sounds like a complaint of his outward sufferings. He had been repeatedly struck on the head with a staff, a crown of thorns forced into his head, staggered all the way to Golgotha, and finally was nailed to the cross. And yet we do not see in scripture a place where he verbally acknowledges his physical pain except for this verse in which he says, I thirst. Here is the one who offered living water. Here is the one who said, anyone who is thirsty may come to me and drink. Here is the one who stated that those who drink the water he gives will never be thirsty again. And yet, he thirsts. But to quote the NIV commentarian Gary Burge, the cross is a portion of the work God had sent him to do. His cry of thirst is not a desperate word from a dying man under a Middle Eastern sun. Jesus speaks in order to fulfill scripture. Recalling Psalm 69 verse 21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. This prophetic declaration would also express express the travail of his soul as we read about in Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. Jesus thirsted after the glorifying of God and the accomplishment of the work of our redemption. Bearing our sins and making intercession for all of us who would put our faith and trust in him. Jesus knows us. He knows our sufferings, and he longs to redeem his people. Maybe there are some of us here today who feel like you're on your own cross. And though you aren't on there to save the world from sin and death like Jesus, you can relate with this feeling of longing, of thirsting, of being in such anguish of body, mind, or soul that you yearn for the Lord to bring you His redemption. Maybe you are here today suffering from physical ailments or disease like cancer or diabetes, and you need God to break in, redeem, and heal your body. Maybe you are here today suffering from a broken heart due to the loss of a loved one or relationship. Or maybe you feel like you have nailed your own self up on the cross due to your sin and shame or your past mistakes and seeming failures. Friends, I am here today as one, as one who thirsts. Been in a season of great pain and suffering entangled by the regret and shame of my past mistakes and failures, 
And yet, thankfully, my God has broken through to me with his patient love. He is so lovingly patient. And I've, I've, I've experienced this directly from his spirit, but also very powerfully through the faithfulness of my loving friends in my community here at this church. So many of you in here today. I can so easily forget that it is not me, but my loving Savior who is at work on my behalf, ushering in fullness of life and redemption. And that goes for you too. The cross and His thirst for us, His people, to know Him and to know His redeeming power is the evidence of His great love. My prayer for you and for myself is that we would not forget the words of St. Paul in Ephesians 1, verses 7 and 8. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. John 19.30, Jesus said, it is finished. This verse has also been translated as, it is consummated. It carries with it the idea of completion, of fulfillment. This statement is traditionally called the word of triumph. Pastor Adam Hamilton explains it this way. These last words are seen as a cry of victory. Jesus had now completed what he came to do. A plan was fulfilled, a salvation was made possible, a love was shown. He had taken our place. He had demonstrated both humanity's brokenness and God's love. He had offered himself fully to God as a sacrifice on behalf of humanity. And as he died, it was finished. I wonder, do we finish anything? Do you ever finish anything? Um, how many projects do you have that are unfinished? I don't know about you, but my list is very, lar very long. I'm so far behind I only have seven grandchildren, according to my scrapbooks, when in reality I have ten grandchildren and the youngest one is seven years old. Um, that's a little embarrassing to admit. In addition to scrapbooks, I've got remodeling plans and reorganization ideas and, oh my goodness, a whole long list of quilts I want to make. There are so many things. For most of us, it seems like our work will never be done. There are too many things on my list and too little time to do them, and it doesn't end, and it is exhausting. But being nearer to retirement now than not, I'm looking at my life through different lenses these days. While my hobbies are fun, they're not the substance of all that I desire to accomplish in my life. I don't want to leave things undone. I want to make sure to finish what God has purposed for me to do while I'm here on this earth. So let's look at this statement. The Greek word used here is tetelestai, and it means literally, that the debt has been paid. It's done. It's complete. In those days, a freed prisoner or a freed slave would carry a document with tetelestai written across it to prove that they are truly free. But most commonly, 
the word was used to mark a debt that had been paid in full. The debtor would have that document, and the person who had loaned them the money many times would nail that declaration up on the door. The connection between receipts and what Christ accomplished would have been quite clear to those standing at the foot of the cross. And on the surface, this statement does stand on its own. What more could there be? Um, It's done. But there's more to this little saying of Christ. Because that word in the Greek is in a certain tense. Uh, Hang with me here, okay? Um, Tense in the Greek language is a very important part of the language. And unfortunately, that's usually lost in translation. Jesus speaks this in the perfect tense, which is very rare, and it has no English equivalent. In English, it would take several statements to cover what that one word said. What that tense means is that the action happens at a particular point in time, but it also continues in the future and has ongoing results. That is overwhelmingly significant to us as Christians. When Jesus says, it is finished, what he's really saying is, it is finished and it will continue to be finished. So what exactly was finished? It is finished. All the prophecies of the Old Testament, which pointed at the sufferings of Messiah, were accomplished. It is finished. The ceremonial law is abolished. It is finished. His sufferings, both of his soul and of his body, are done. It is finished. The work of man's redemption and salvation is now complete. It is finished and will continue to be finished. This is the ongoing nature of our salvation. So in Jesus' statement, we have a declaration of salvation that is both momentary and eternal. We are saved at a specific point in time, our debt is paid, we're ransomed from the kingdom of darkness, and then we confidently rest in the reality that it will continue to be finished. With this one word, to tetelestai, spoken by Jesus on the cross, it was finished at that moment, And it is finished for all time. We can rest from trying to earn our salvation. We can stop our striving. God is going to finish the work he's doing in your life. We can know that he is going to finish the purposes that he has for us. Being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In Luke 23, 46, we read the final saying from the cross. Jesus, with the last bit of his strength, he says in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This last saying of Jesus is traditionally traditionally called the word of reunion and is theologically interpreted as the proclamation of Jesus joining God the Father in heaven. So let's talk about this. (laughs) 
what happened in heaven and on earth as Jesus spoke these words and was reunited with the Father? Because these weren't just words that he spoke. He didn't just move locations back to his original home place. No, something tremendous happened in that moment that affected all of humanity. In that moment, the son entered into presence with the father. As they were reunited, Jesus opened up the new and living way for us to access the father. In Hebrews 9, it speaks of this new and living way idea. And in the Gospel of Matthew, another account of Jesus on the cross, we read this scripture. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Michael J. Wilkins writes about this man-made curtain of the human-crafted temple. He says, this 60-foot-high curtain was split from the top to the bottom. And it was a sign that God himself abolished the separation from the Holy of Holies, signifying that new and living way is now open for all people to enter into his presence through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So I remember very vividly the time I caught the profound significance of this idea of the temple, the curtain being torn from the top to the bottom, (laughs) and unification with the Father, and how it was personal to me. Y'all, it actually changed my life. See, I came out of two different uh, religious affiliations early in my life, and while they were very religious, they weren't very relational with God. I knew a lot of facts about God, but I didn't really know him very well. These religions had a very negative effect on me. I was literally terrified of God from the first church's teachings and practices, and I felt like He was always mad at me. After that season, when I got saved in the second church, I felt liberated. I believed that Jesus loved me and died for my sins, and I would one day be with him in heaven. But I was also taught that I had to live my entire life out before I could intimately know him. I prayed to Jesus but I believed that he was far, far away from me. And here I was, stuck trying to be good. There was a lot of pressure in that certain denomination to be good. And I was actually pretty good at being good at this point in my life. I didn't smoke or drink or say doo-doo, so I was good. And life was treating me pretty good. I was following the rules, and nothing terribly bad had happened since I got saved. But deep inside my soul, I longed for more. I mean, I really longed for more. That longing was more, um, it was, uh, that longing for more was, was and still is today. The Holy Spirit of God working in my life. You see, the Holy Spirit knew that even though I had realized a measure of freedom in my relationship with Jesus, I was bound up by the things I was taught for so many years. The Spirit wanted me to know who the Father is and who I am in Him. So fast forward to this ministry time at the Brazosport Vineyard circa 1998, a couple of years ago. Uh, Linda Gwynn, was praying for me, and she proclaimed this scripture over me. She said, at at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. She began to share a vision she was receiving from God that was just for me. 
in the vision, God was reaching through as the curtain was being torn, reaching to touch my hand as I was reaching out for him. As she spoke the words, the reality hit that God loved me so much and had been pursuing me all this time. This revelation that I actually have access to God himself woke me. Parts of me that had been lying dormant became alive and began functioning. The curtain of wrong beliefs between myself and God, it was breached and a fuller connection with God was realized. My prayer for you is that you will recognize that Jesus' reunion with the Father restores us and leads us into rich, meaningful, and love-filled life. We can stand in confidence knowing who we are and how God feels about us. He loves us. So following Jesus' lead, we can say and we can mean, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, not just at the moment of our death, but every moment of every day. He's reaching through your curtain and into every moment. All you need to do is reach out and grab his hand. So John's gospel closes out the event of Jesus' death in this way, John 19. So now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken so that the bodies could be taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who was with the man who saw it gives this testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. And he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was close by, they laid Jesus there. It's impossible for me to imagine what the followers of Jesus were feeling at that moment. The man they loved, but more than that, the man they had put their faith in to change their physical existence, abolishing the rule of the Romans, establishing an everlasting kingdom under the name of the King David of Israel, was dead. Certainly there were feelings of hopelessness and helplessness to a degree that we can never understand as we read the biblical account. Why? How how is it that we, or why would I say that we can't experience that? It's because we've never had to experience the three days from burial to resurrection. We've always known the end of the story before we read it. We knew the outcome. 
And tonight we know it. So we have great hope to be here tonight. And yet we end this Good Friday service on a solemn mood. However, we invite you to join us Sunday morning to celebrate the third day, the sunrise, the empty tomb, Resurrection Sunday. Father, thank you for all you've done. Thank you for the life that you give. And tonight, Father, by the death of your Son, Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice that was made. We praise you and we bless you. Amen.